Hi, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our debate tonight. Tonight we have the College Republicans, represented by Bill Hibbs and Jim Fisher, debating the College Democrats, represented by Joe Tolano and Maya Marshall. I'd like to thank everyone for being here, and just a reminder, you can catch this later on YouTube as well. Uh, the Republicans won the coin toss before our debate, and they have elected to go second. So our first question goes to Joe Tolano and Myra Marshall on the topic of domestic policy. How would your party approach the health care crisis? Yeah, I'll start. Um, our party has actually addressed the health care crisis uh, through the Affordable Care Act. Um, probably a lot of people know it as Obamacare. Um, in this act, uh, what is done is allowed for health care to be more affordable for um, more Americans in this country. Um, something that's really important and for students here at Westchester University, if they're under the care of or something, um, under the Affordable Health Care Act, um, we do not have, um, if you are under the 26, you're still able to be covered under your parents' insurance, which is something, something uh, great for the student. Um, something that was left out of the Affordable Care Act, um, which, um, which unfortunately had to be taken out to get through. Um, obviously, not every Democrat in the House in 2010, even though the Democrats controlled the House then, not every Democrat was totally for it. So in order to get it through, they had to take out some provisions, such as a public option, which some states, such as the state, my home state of New York, does have a public option. And from personal experience, I do believe the public, public option does work well. Um, like many people, my father lost his job in financial crisis in 2008. And we were on, he was on unemployment, and we did use the New York State public option. And until he did get a job about a year later, in 2009, he, he just paid $9 a month to the public, state public option, and it kept me and my sister and my mother from spending a lot of money <laughs> uh, for everyday medical costs. And also with the Affordable Care Act, um, it, it stopped healthcare companies from denying uh, coverage for people with pre-existing conditions that want to get insurance, uh, which is really important because uh, you know, people need care, people need health care, and it should be unacceptable for people in the United States of America to not even have access to health care. Um, it should be made affordable for people, and I think that's one of the most important things of this Affordable Care Act, is that it allows for people who might not able to afford insurance, to be able to have that insurance, I think that's really important. One of the most important revisions in, in the Affordable Care Act is that by 2014 next year, the health reform will eliminate all discrimination for pre-existing conditions from health insurance companies, which I'm sure everyone knows that insurance companies are made up to get money. They are a private industry. And it also start the process of expanding health care to cover an additional 32 million Americans. At least that's the latest estimate. Thank you. And the Republicans will now have about a minute and a half to rebut those statements. Okay. Um, health care is very important for this country. Um, it's important that we keep our people healthy so they can go on their productive lives. Um, now, the funny thing about Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act is that it's called the Affordable Care Act. Um, in the Affordable Care Act, you have something called a 2.3% medical device tax. Um, not, not the profits of medical, medical device makers, but their sales. So if, a, so if a medical company, medical device maker, sold $1 million worth of product and made $100,000 off it, their two, that 2.3% 2 tax on their sales would take a quarter of their profits. Now there's no way that, it, that, that, it, um, that the, our medical devices are going to be able to stay the same price when you, have, when you raise taxes on their um, Makers. Now, the way to uh, fix health care is um, there's a, the high costs are, are attributed to a plethora of causes. Um, we need to we do need to overhaul it. Um, Obamacare was not the correct overhaul. They added more government when you actually need to reduce it. Um, the reason health care is expensive, um, health health insurance companies are only allowed to sell within state lines. So what you've done is you've created 50 little monopolies. 
And if you compare it to auto insurance, with auto insurance, it can be sold across state lines. You have companies like the General, like Geico, who provide very low cost, but like the cut rate insurance, but it gives you your basic coverage. Um, if you allow states to sell across, or companies to sell across state lines, you would create cheaper alternatives to the very expensive health uh, plans that we see today. Our our healthcare, sorry, our healthcare is expensive. We actually have less doctor visits annually than socialized medicine uh, countries, and that's attributed to how successful our healthcare is. But with the monopolies, if you can destroy those monopolies and break it up and make it a privatized thing you can bring the cost of healthcare down. It doesn't need to be a government-run program to allow people to have healthcare for a cheap price. You realize we're not sitting up here debating getting car insurance for lower income because that is not monopolized and it's capable of moving forward at a low cost. Regardless of maybe you get, at the lower end, you get a much less um, valuable product, but you can still purchase it along with your wealth. And that's um, why it needs to be broken up from the monopolies. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, moving on to our next question, going to the Republicans. What should the government's role in the practice of abortion be? Um, abortion is a very tricky issue. Um, it doesn't really seem to have, it has a, some partisan split, but you will find people on both sides of the issue in, uh, in both parties. Um, help, I personally, the Republican Party platform on abortion is that it's murder. Um, Regardless of which stages, um, they will we will make exceptions for rape, incest, and um, life of the mother. But besides that, there really is no um, role for the government in abortion except for to not allow it in its um, management. Yeah, the GOP platform stands that abortion is unethical. However, we do allow abortion in America, and we don't, as Republicans, want to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's not what we push for. We feel it's morally wrong. I do believe that uh, late-term abortion and uh, third trimester abortions should be, or partial birth abortion, I'm sorry, should be illegal. That is, if anybody is familiar and has done research on how that is performed, it is absolutely gruesome. I do, I personally do not support abortion early on in the stage of pregnancy, but I do not see that that should be illegal. And I also don't think that it should be funded by taxpayer dollars. I think that that should be a privatized uh, expense. Okay, thank you. And a minute and a half for the Democrats. We just want to give a rundown of how we stand. We do support Roe v. Roe v. Wade, and the Supreme Court decision on that has been clear. Um, we do support investing in stem cell research and other, other medical research. Um, we will also would like to pursue embryonic stem cell research. A lot of, I'm sure everyone knows what that can do, how that can help uh, paralysis patients and whatnot. Uh, we do support the right to, right to choose, and uh, choice is a fundamental constitutional right. And I always look at it this way, that politicians are not the experts when it comes to abortion. Who should decide if a woman should get an abortion is the woman and the doctor. When you have, when someone has cancer, do you go to a po your politician, your local congressman, or the U.S. President Obama, what should I do uh, for my cancer screening or whatever? No, you go to your doctor, it's between you and your doctor. Our next question goes to Democrats again. Uh, where does your party stand on affirmative action? <clears throat> on affirmative action, um, our party stance is that it, it is still necessary to have affirmative action programs here in the United States. <clears throat> um, one of the reasons why affirmative action programs with America was because there, obviously, there, there's still, um, you know, a racial divide here in America, and you know, there's still economic divides here in America, and these things should be factored in to people's um, opportunities as far as getting jobs, being able to go to a a school or anything like that, because you know, people still have prejudice still have its attitudes towards other groups. It still exists. And to say that it doesn't exist is very naive. Um, it, it, like I said, it comes down to just opportunity. And people should be given an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, 
I mean, everyone knows that quotas, racial quotas in this country have been outlawed for a long time, but you could also relate to affirmative action to the Voting Rights Act that is in question today. Some people think that it should be overturned. Some people think, oh, we have an African-American president or a post-racial society. But obviously that's not true, and anyone who thinks that might be is really kidding themselves. A lot of places in this country are discriminatory, but you have to remember that affirmative action is meant to, let's say, myself, I'm a Caucasian, I'm from Iron here, he's African American, we have the exact same credentials, he's African American, I'm Caucasian, when we have the exact same credentials, they look at it and say, okay, well, he's, he's African American, maybe we should take that into account also. I don't think that. Uh, yeah, I'll continue. Um, it, it is, it is noted that race is not, should not, not be used as the determining factor to make a decision if someone should be entered into a certain program. But it should be considered as a factor that makes sense, um, uh, along with a whole bunch of other things. Uh, but it, it, it is still important nonetheless. It's still important nonetheless. It's just that you know, someone, it should be you known that if someone is African American or find a program, the decision between the two candidates should just be based so you know, that is not that is not good. That's what we're Thank you. And that the public's turn. I think that what my colleague Joe had said about being chosen for a job or maybe not having that advantage because he's black and he's white with the same credentials, having affirmative action to fix that inherently does exactly what racism does. It gives now Joe has or now uh, he has the advantage because affirmative action is going to push him through because he's black, hypothetically. And I mean, I think that in modern times, seeing uh, a white man be chosen over a black man because of credential or because of race instead of credential is is kind of a far stretch. I don't really see that happening as often, if at all. I mean, that's kind of a a new point when you're discussing affirmative action. Um, Additionally, Thomas Sow, a noted uh, political scientist, noted in his book, Affirmative Action Around the World, an empirical study that um, in the U.S., the uh, affirmative action favoring blacks has actually hurts um, low-class whites um, disproportionately to um, or middle class and higher class whites. Um, so it, it really, it doesn't really fix the problem um, to say that, oh, because whites were favored back then, now we're going to favor blacks. It doesn't seem like, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think Joe touched on the uh, Voting Voting Rights Act. Um, the part of, part of the question of the Voting Rights Act is uh, Act Five of it, or Part Five of it. And uh, the reason it's unconstitutional is because you're forcing um, states, like uh, specific states and counties, to uh, present their election uh, procedures to the federal government. And um, it's it's very it's very obscure the way they do it. They just picked out random uh, places. I know in New York City, Queensboro has to do it, but then Manhattan does it. So. Where, how do they really pick? And it's it's unconstitutional to force certain states and counties to um, provide details to the federal government on how they're running their election, which is a constitutionally guard right for states. Thank you. Our next question goes to Republicans. To what degree should the federal government regulate immigration? Um, immigration is very important to this country. Um, this country was founded for, um, with immigrants. Um, we, we really feel for those who live, in other, who live in other countries where their government's not as friendly towards them and they want to create a better life so they come here. And that's great. We welcome them with open arms. But um, the current immigration system is flawed. It's too expensive to come to this country legally. It's nearly $1,000 for a green card, and that's just one of the many fees. It takes too, too long, sometimes 10 years, to get your citizenship. So our, the, cost and the time and cost it takes to come to this country legally promotes illegal immigration. So if we push for less bureaucratic red tape and make it quicker and easier to come here, we could right then and there reduce on um, illegal immigration in this country. Now, fed immigration is a federal issue per the Constitution, but the Obama administration's lawsuits against states like Arizona, Alabama, South Carolina, and Utah simply don't make any sense. If the federal government's not doing their job enforcing the, um, enforcing the border laws and, and uh, immigration laws, um, and to suggest that states shouldn't be allowed to pick up the slack where the federal government is lacking is, to me, a little absurd. Um, in 2006, Congress passed a law requiring uh, a fence along the entire border. It's still not finished. Um, that has to be finished. It would, it would greatly reduce on people coming across the border illegally, 
It would reduce the number of illegal drugs coming through this country, the number of illegal people, and it would also reduce, on the flip side, the number of United States weapons leaving um, America and entering Mexico and killing innocent Mexicans in Mexico. So um, really, offense and uh, reforming our immigration system is the best way to address illegal immigration. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have to go hand in hand. We have to beef up our borders to stop them from coming in, but then we have to also, you're never going to stop them. They're determined and they're going to get here. It's their life. And we have to make it attractive for them to do it legally and accessible for them to do it legally. And they, um, one of the things that we lose out on by having illegal immigration is remittances. They send millions of dollars back to their homeland to people uh, tax-free. And that's money leaving our economy. If we can make them legal citizens, then that money can stimulate our economy with the taxes that are paid off. And additionally, um, we need to look at how they're staying here. Um, they can't just simply come here and then not do anything and just somehow live off uh, the land. Um, they are definitely being hired by employers. Um, those employers need to have very stiff penalties. Um, you can't just say, okay, it's a slap on the wrist. It has to be very very specific and very strict, and then you can really reduce on the amount of legal immigration. And the Democrats, sir? Um, well, I do agree with a lot of the points that you guys did make. Um, no one necessarily wants people to immigrate to this country illegally, but the days of coming from the old country with a potato and 10 bucks in your pocket to Ellis Island are over. So um, it's, it is an expensive venture and it does need to be reformed. But um, the notion that illegal immigrants are living tax free in this nation is, in my opinion, a lie. Yes, no, they're not paying income tax but they do have to live somewhere. They do have to pay, they do, have to, they do pay sales tax. They do contribute to the economy in other ways. Also, they, do I have a I'm gonna um, Well, actually, you know, I'll, I'll talk about something too. Uh, in regards to, you know, the Obama administration and you know, how they're treating the laws in Arizona, for instance. You gotta look at how those laws are set up. Uh, go ahead and pull some random person over and ask them, hey, are you a United States citizen? Now, how, how do you determine if one person is being suspicious of being a United States citizen? You know, usually people put somebody over, you know, they have a tan skin or something like that, you know? Um, so it's racial, it's racial profiling. Okay, well, um, and that, that's, that's a problem. Uh, also, um, for what a lot of the a lot of illegal immigrants are living in this country, they've been living in this country a long time as legal citizens, haven't broken any laws. And what we do agree with is a pathway to citizenship for illegal immigrants that have that are are non that are law-abiding citizens. And also, a lot of them have children in this country. They're basically, basically, Amer they're basically Americanized at this point in time. So, and also, the Obama administration has deported more legal immigrants than any <coughs> the previous administration. Um, something else that I want to talk about too um, was the Dream Act. Um, you know, if the child was brought over here. Um, you know, the person was brought over here by their parents, and they were at a young age. They you know, it's not their fault. And if they're a hardworking person here in America and they want to contribute to society, they should be able to be given that chance to. And what that act allows for them to do is to become a citizen of the United States, get their education and contribute to society and they can be a potential future innovator in this country. Um, you know, they can uh, teach someone and that person will be the next big thing. So I think that's that's really important that um, those people should be given a chance to because it is not their fault. Thank you, John. Our next question. In light of recent violent events, such as mass shootings in Colorado and Connecticut, how would you ensure that only responsible individuals can become gun owners? <clears throat> First off, let us say that we both sit. Uh, that was oh, actually their question. I thought you had the last time. <laughs> um, what I think we need to do is we 
you need to have a smart way of going about um, controlling guns, going to people who should not have guns in their hands. We need to be able to have a way to screen people to see whether or not if they're mentally sound to be able to have guns. Um, also, she brought up that we need a way of actually tracking the purchase of these gun sales. Um, you know, and, and there needs to be some type of registration system where we go ahead and know who has who has the gun. And it, it is not a first step towards you know us taking the way taking away guns of other people. It's not. Um, it, it's just the way for us to have a way to track these guns and make sure that, you know, if these guns are used, we know who's using these guns. And I think that's really important for us to have a way of tracking. Um, we both sit here as assault rifle and handgun owners and concealed weapon permit carriers. And first off, the Second Amendment is explicitly clear. The right of the citizens bear arms shall not be infringed. I understand that in I get a little trouble there, but I understand that in light of recent events that things need to change and that it's not 1776 anymore. However, first off, I think that there's a very misunderstanding, a very big misunderstanding from the Democratic Party and citizens that are democratic about how you purchase firearms. I've purchased firearms prior to recent mass shootings and after recent mass shootings. There's a very strict background system. You have to fill out piles of paperwork to buy a handgun, a shotgun, an assault rifle, and any type of weapon you have to. There is a system in place to find out if somebody is mentally incapable of having a firearm. The problem is the, the background check system is not flawed. What is flawed is the fact that the states are not strictly regulated in the fact that they must pass on mentally ill documents to the state. That is where your lapse is. I mean, that can be seen in two of the four major last shootings. They, they were deemed mentally ill, especially Virginia Tech. He was deemed mentally ill as a juvenile. That was locked down because he was a juvenile. So when he was of age, it was not carried on to the state that he was mentally ill. There is a flaw there, and that needs to be addressed, absolutely. But we do currently, I think that a lot of people think you can walk into a store and buy a gun, and that we need to have background checks. There is a very strict background check process currently in place. Uh, yeah, um, just wanted to continue. Um, like you said, the Second Amendment is very clear. Um, I, a personal quote I like is, I believe, from Rush Limbaugh. He said, "The reason we have a first, the reason, the only reason we have a first amendment is because we have a second amendment. In my mind, it's the most important amendment. Um, without it, you can't really guarantee any of the other ones. Um, additionally, guns do not kill people. People kill people. If I shot someone, I, I shot them. If I stabbed someone, I stabbed them. The gun didn't shoot them, and then, and then I stabbed them. It's, it, it's the weapon is the ultimate. Um, the person is the ultimate decision on whether or not the weapon is used." Um, if, if you look at a lot of crime statistics, places like, or actually after the Clinton gun ban, the assault weapons ban, um, there were 100, 10 years before the, before the ban, there were 173 mass shootings with 766 victims. But during the 10 years of the ban, from 1995 to 2004, there were 182 mass shootings with 820 victims. Now those numbers are very similar, and uh, we're not saying that um, it, caused, it caused more, but obviously it did not decrease them. So. Um, Inventing gun-free zones and trying to take guns away from law-abiding citizens just simply is not the answer to protect people. A, a good person with a gun in his hand is the ultimate answer to a bad person with a gun in his hand. And criminals will still get their hands on guns. There are so many, there are millions of guns in circulation for illegal use. And real quick, I know we have to move on, but the problem also with this liberal agenda is that through the media, first off, the politicians making these laws are some of the most well-defended people in our country. They all have armed bodyguards 24-7. I don't think that they're the people that should be making the decisions on whether or not a citizen can have a gun to defend themselves, including Dianne Feinstein, who is leading the March on Gun Control. In 1995, she felt threatened for her life, so what did she do? She went out and got a gun and a concealed weapon permit. That's what the average American does. And the liberal media is pushing this agenda by show, that highlighting these mass shootings, and they are awful, they are very awful, but what you don't hear about is three days after the Newtown shooting, a man walks in, in San Antonio, Texas, a man walks into a restaurant to kill his ex-wife, tries to shoot or shoots another person, then everybody scatters from the restaurant and runs across the street to a movie theater. He chases them down, begins firing at them again, an off-duty police officer with a firearm on him shot the man dead before he could harm anybody else. 
That is response to uh, criminals with guns. Let me just add one more thing. More guns do not do not cause less less deaths. If that was true, then the Fort Hood shooting would have not never happened. Twenty people died in that shooting. It was a military base. Everyone there had guns. There were guns to the war. Well, real quick, um, parts, a lot of those bases aren't actually just. Not yeah, they're gun-free zones. Guns. They're gun-free zones, very similar to a a school or a movie theater. Gentlemen, <laughs> we have lots to do tonight. We can debate afterwards too. So our next question, I believe, yes, is the Republicans trying to decide. That's okay. <laughs> Analysts suggest that Social Security is approaching insolvency. What methods should be taken to prevent this? Um, Social Security um, is very important. Um, we have promised people who have put into the system their entire lives that they will receive what we promise them. It is important that we give them what we promise them. But it will not work if it stays the same. People are living much longer um, after they retire than when they did when the system started, and we haven't changed it since. Um, I think the best way to do it would be to um, anyone 55 or older, you're, you're, you're going to stay exactly the same. But if you're under 55, it's going to have to be restructured a little bit, whether that's retire, raising the retirement age a little bit or um, changing some of the benefits. Um, we, we need to do something. Um, younger people like myself, every time I look at the amount of money I'm giving into Social Security like on my payroll, I just laugh because I know I'm never going to see it. There's no way. It just isn't possible. And so I think the best, I think we should be given an option to be able to leave Social Security and invest in our own future via private options of stocks and other things like that. Anything you add? All right, and the, or the Democrats here? Uh, another way to save Social Security is keep, keep the 6.2% rate the same, but raise the amount of income to what you pay. At the moment, I believe it's 113000 you stop paying Social Security taxes. But if you raise it to two hundred thousand dollars, that would protect the middle and lower class, while while forcing while forcing the upper class, who really in reality they don't need social security taxes. Rich people they stop paying social security taxes after January second every single year. I mean, to, after to, if you just raise it two hundred thousand dollars, it puts more into the more into the social security system and protects the middle and lower class. Also, another an alternate way would be means testing, um, which is the government would determine whether or not you would apply for you could apply for Social Security. So when the wealthy retire and they get to the Social Security age, and in reality they really don't need that money. It's really not that much money anyway. So they don't need to. They don't. They would receive Social Security. Um, also, um, Social Security shouldn't be put into the markets. It just should um, reinsurance because. Markets fail. Um, so what happens when you go ahead and you put in everything and you can invest in to, to Social Security, and then that fails and you don't have anything left? That, that's a, that's a really a problem. Um, so we shouldn't be able to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question goes to the Democrats. Given the inherent inequality between civil unions and the institution of marriage, what should be done to address the recognition of homosexual relationships? Um, well, uh, put it out there, we do support fully repealing the Defense of uh, Marriage Act. Um, right now, we have civil unions that are supposed to be separate but equal, but in reality, they're not separate but equal. Um, the Supreme Court has ruled in the past that separate, equal, separate but equal is not equal. As long as marriage is a government institution, all couples, regardless of sexual orientation, as far as government concerned, have the right to get married. I just want to bring up that uh, separate but, uh, but equal type thing. Um, you, you all know what separate but what equal was um, back in the Deep South in the 1960s and you know, the civil rights movement and stuff. It was, it was separate, but it was not equal. And we need to look at that today. Um, and, and it's also the view that you have of um, people who have, who are homosexual, and they have love for another person of the same sex. Um, they should be granted the same opportunities that married, married couples, heterosexual married couples have. Because, you know, they, 
they're, they're two people that love each other the same. They probably live with each other. And you know, it, it, should, it should matter um, upon a person's sexual orientation of you know, what, what kind of benefits or something that they get. Everybody should be treated equally. It doesn't matter who you love. We also support a bill or a Supreme Court decision that would make marriage a union between two consenting adults. I know a lot of arguments are that, well, where does it end? If you can two people of the same gender can get married, then people can be married objects or animals. It just that's silly in my opinion. Just make it between two two consenting adults. Thank you. <coughs> the, uh, the issue of gay marriage is a very big quarrel in the Republican Party right now. It's really split in the party. Um, the Republican platform, as of now, stands at uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. This is a very difficult topic because I tend to sway from the party beliefs on this issue, and I know that when you have two people that have the party right now, and I think that you'll see a very Domestic policy question. To protect poor citizens. Um, the poor need our help. Um, living below poverty would be unimaginable for almost all of us. Um, the best way to protect poor citizens is to give them jobs and to do that is to get us out of our current recession. Um, to do that, we should cut taxes for everyone. Um, allow businesses to hire more people. That poor person won't be poor if he has a job. Taxes to the government who just wasted on um, a number of different things they could waste it on. Um, all these shovel ready jobs are going to propel our economy and boy are we ready. Shovel ready after all. Um, so jobs day to day, but these are eight to twelve dollar an hour jobs. These are level one wage jobs. And what happens is of those middle end jobs and mid to low end because they're overqualified for the position. Why not hire them? This is pushing out the. that if you, you can still be poor and still have a job in America, creating more jobs and being poor does not necessarily mean that that person, because they have a job, they're going to be out of poverty. That's, that's not the case. Uh, what we need to do is we need to raise the minimum wage, which will allow for that person to actually, you know, be able to afford to not be in poverty. I think that's really important. Um, you know, what, how much it should be raised, that's, that's up for debate. Um, but the thing is that if you're, if you're working a full-time job and you're making minimum wage, you still can't afford to live on your own. You basically four jobs just to make ends meet. And what happens is if you're working all these jobs and you're, you know, if you're working full-time, even more children will, will have a tough time focusing in, in school and, and that type of thing. So I, I think what we should do is we should be able to raise the minimum wage and, and make it uh, make it better. Although I agree that it would be nice to person out of poverty, but it also really sunk the person that was sitting next to him that just lost his job to compensate for the raising of minimum wage. It's going to create a halt in hiring if we don't have one already. It's idealistic. I mean, of course, we all want everybody to make more money, but the money's not there for them to have. So. All right. Thank you all very much.
covered a lot so far, and we're moving into our next area of questions. This question goes to the Democrats first. Where does your party stand on extrajudicial killings stemming from the war on terror? Uh, 30th, 2011, uh, there was a drone strike and it killed two American citizens. But these residing in Yemen at the time, and they were both tied with terrorism activities. Um, particularly, they were tied to the Fort Hood massacre and the 2009 Christmas Day bomb plot. A drone was used to kill these American citizens. Um, but before the U.S. went ahead, went through the U.N. Um, they went through the Security Council you know, to, to have their citizenship revoked. If we need to follow the proper laws and procedures of doing this, uh, of these extrajudicial killings, um, but it should be noted that these extrajudicial killings are these people are clearly a threat. You know, they're clearly an immediate threat to the American people, even if they are Americans. Now, you know, you will believe that because it's easy for to, to go ahead and revoke somebody's citizenship and say, okay, we're going to go out there and we're going to kill them. Um, you know, it, it might be easy to do that here in the United States of America. Um, the thing is that to the American people and all other means of apprehending that person um, and, that, and that terrorist and their You know, then there there has to, you know then it's justified. But you know, at the same time, the killing of just an innocent American civilian or an American civilian who you know walked across the street and went to jaywalk or something, they were killed for that. That doesn't make any sense. But if that person is clearly a threat to the American people, or clearly um, an immediate threat to the American people, then. Um, all of the means are exhausted of apprehending that person. Yeah. Just. All right, your public concern? Um, I think this is one of those issues where, <clears throat> excuse me, we kind of agree. Um, <clears throat> overall, they kind of agree. The, it, it is unfortunate that innocent civilians can be lost, but. Um, with the drone wars, we've had so much success. Uh, Al Awaki and his son were both killed in Pakistan. Um, positives that he's highlighted. The only fear I have of it is that while in support of it for what it does, it opens the door for negative impact in the future. When you give that kind of power to a government, you it, right now it's not being abused, but who's to say in 30 years that they might not, they might that the president can detain unlawfully any citizen suspected of a terrorist act without due process or trial. I do stand behind it in this current uh, political climate that we have. Turn into in the future. All right, thank you. Considering the rising death toll in Syria, what role, if any, should the United States play in managing this crisis? The current situation in Syria is huge for so many reasons. It affects so many aspects of Syria has turned his artillery inwards on his rights aspect of it isn't enough to be involved, then there's plenty of other reasons. Politically, Syria and I know we're going to get into Iran later, so I don't want to go too deep into it, but Assad is a key ally for Ahmadinejad. Tight bond. And if you can break that bond by removing Assad from power, 
you let, give us a lot more leverage in the argument against uh, Iran and nuclear disarmament. Um, <clears throat> another positive effect that could come from it is uh, Michal, the leader of Hamas, who is also a key figure in the um, debate over Israel and um, Pakistan and, er, and Palestine. They have operations to Iran. So if uh, Syria falls, they will be on the run and they will have to go restructure somewhere else. And that gives us a lot more leverage in our debate over Israeli borders. And that's a Pretty much sum up what we how we the Democratic Party feels is that we can't get involved in every single but we, it's where it's tough economic times, we just simply do not have the money. Um, we have already had two wars on a credit on a credit card less decade. another warrant on the credit card and sick of putting ourselves in a bigger debt with the UN Security Council to go about the right method of dealing with this crisis. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I just kind of, what, what I want to say is that it's important before we focus on the issues of another country such as Syria. <laughs> Um, I, I, I kind of have uh, this thing that I, I like to say. It when, you, when you're on an airplane, right? And you know, one of the first things they tell you to when they go through all the emergency procedures is they go ahead and they tell you that go ahead and put the face mask on another person, um, or you put that on someone else. Um, you know, I, I believe. That Domestically, because we have so many problems here in the United States, and we can't go to every single country and directly intervene in the issues of that country. You know, we need to be able to help ourselves adequately before we're able to help another country out, such as Syria, uh, directly. So it is not smart for us to go ahead and go over Syria. Um, I was not clear about what I was saying. I do not support putting American troops on the ground in Syria. I support <coughs> reaching out to Turkey. Rebels. That is a little tricky because that region is so volatile. That but um, I would not, I'm not in support of putting troops on the ground. Okay. All right. Moving on to our next. Accusations of currency manipulation have been made against China. Sorry, I think it was Was it? I'm losing track. I apologize. All right. Going to the Republicans. Accusations. How would your party go about ensuring that China plays by the same set of rules as everyone else? Um, China is one of our biggest trading partners. Uh, most of our imports, or most of our, yeah, most of our imports come from them. Um, our economies are very much based off each other. If one fails, the other does. So it's, China is very important. Right between estimates range between 20 and 40 percent. Um, it makes us very makes it very difficult for us to compete internationally when someone has a low when someone is devaluing their currency. Um, the amount of economic growth they've seen, those double digit growths every year, it should put their currency up much closer to ours than it is. Now, it's hap um, the Economic Institute. Chinese currency manipulation. 101,000 of those were in Pennsylvania. So it really does affect us. Um, unfortunately, what to do, it's very tough. Um, the World Trade Organization um, does have a ban on subsidies for exporting countries uh, to help keep down costs in the other country. 
Now, while it may not seem like they're doing that directly, currency manipulation is a de facto subsidy. By keeping their, um, keeping their currency lower, it enables their uh, businesses to sell their, their product for much cheaper. I'm stopping this, but like the UN, it's not very effective, so it's really hard to get anything done through an international organization. Anything to add? All right, the Democrats, sir? Yeah. Um, if, if China is not playing by the we should work with it, other countries to make sure that if China is, are, are practicing these, uh, these, these practices, if they're, if they are, not stop doing business with them, but we need to, uh, cannot go on. We need to make a clear message. Um, what I think we also need to do is just keep more jobs in the United States, uh, tax businesses that uh, that move jobs to China. You know? I'm very sure. <coughs> what methods should be pursued to ensure Iran does not acquire nuclear weapons? Um, obviously, it's a very difficult topic because we are, it's not like we own Iran. We can't interfere with their nuclear program, which would be to invade Iran, which. sanctions against Iran. The United States does have sanctions against Iran that obviously hurt the uh, Iranian economy and has a drastic effect on them. And by that, obviously, the, the people of Iran will get be more upset with the current administration. Um, direct enemies, as everyone knows. And um, The Iran situation is very complicated, but first and foremost, one of our greatest allies and a keystone for democracy in the Middle East is Israel. And we have to support them to the hilt. And by telling them to go back to their 1967 borders, there's a reason they were attacked three out of four times in four Arab-Israeli wars. And they push out because they don't want tanks on their borders. And the problem with that is you, um, you can't cripple them by putting them back to those borders. We need, we need to not, the, the sanctions aren't working. Um, they're only hurting the, uh, the people of Iran. They're not hurting the government. The government's agenda is still in full effect. The, the way to approach this is, and you don't back down. And although I agree with START, which is Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, I agree with uh, reducing the nuclear warheads on this earth to blow it up millions of times, and that's unnecessary. However, we cannot lead by example on that. We cannot bring our nuclear stockpile down while Russia, Pakistan, and other nations continue to stay where they are. Uh, we're the only industrialized or superpower that does not do this currently. We should not be abandoning uh, missile bases in Poland and um, I believe the Czech Republic, but um, keeping them there. We need to project our power and that's how you back Iran down. The sanctions, I did support the sanctions at the beginning, that's how you start any our allies. And attacking, or not attacking, uh, supporting the rebels in Syria and the overthrow of Assad helps that greatly because that really backs Iran into a corner and isolates it. Alright, thank you. Uh, that concludes our report. to the Republicans. Many people suggest the drug war, which began in 1972, has been both ineffective and costly. How does the drug war is definitely a big issue. Um, we've spent a lot of money on it. Um, 
very high. Um, one of the reasons could be is that when someone's labeled as a drug offender through their criminal record, um, people have the legal means they had previous and go back to jail. Um, or I guess um, in 2012, this past election, Colorado and Washington State both legalized marijuana for recreational use. Um, it's it's been called a federal issue. It's it's very it's kind of a tricky situation. Um, the Republican Party stance is to um, I believe it's a state right to choose. The state wants to legalize a drug that's have no role in um, drug enforcement policies. Um, the Tenth Amendment is very clear on states' rights. Um, yeah, we. wants hard drugs, heroin, cocaine to be legalized, but if a state does want to legalize, we did see it, Colorado, Washington State, we uh, legalized marijuana, um, criminalization of marijuana in uh, New York City, Mayor Bloomberg uh, did uh, make, an, uh, make an order, so sort of small, not to be arrested, not to be charged. Um, I that. Yeah, uh, something I had to add is that Nonviolent offenses such as maybe um, having some possession of marijuana with them. If they go to jail, that person is going to be a seasoned criminal after they come out of jail. Um, you know, it's, it's like jail, it's, it's like criminal school. They go to jail, find out how to do things better, whatever, go out, create more criminal acts, and then that person is more likely to go to jail and therefore, you know, a taxpayer money and stuff. So, um, so that, that's one thing. That's going to help out with that problem. Um, also, uh, in order to um, help out with the ending of the war on drugs, what we should do is we should be able to uh, put more money towards the uh, related to drug abuse. Uh, that's important too, as well. More about um, the repercussions of using drugs. Um, with people that are already using drugs, and, you know, they're able to get the proper help that they need, um, then that should greatly reduce the amount of people that um, are going, going to jail and reduce the amount of people that are on drugs. Our next question has been removed because we put it on there in October and it's no longer <coughs> relevant. So we're moving on to the third question on your list. For the Democrats, what is the best strategy to end the recession? One of the best strategies to end the recession is what we could do is Structure, that's going to create jobs. There's a whole bunch of bridges and roads in this country that need to be built because our infrastructure is our infrastructure is basically crumbling. What what if the government invests in infrastructure, there everyone knows that our infrastructure is crumbling. If you leave your house for the day, how many how many potholes do you hit? You go to countries like Europe, like where the Autobahn, which is um, in, in Germany, they live goes through other countries in Europe too, which is perfectly paved, and it's it creates jobs. So investing. Out there. Um, okay. um, we uh, happen to disagree. Um, we saw what those investments. Um, the We spent, he said, we need more infrastructure spending, crumbling bridges and roads. How did that not cover infrastructure? What did we spend it on then, right? If, if we pass these huge stimulus bills rammed down our throats, we didn't have a chance to read it, and somehow it didn't cover the same infrastructure that we're supposed to fix now. And um, so that, um, the way to do it is you cut taxes for everyone, um, allowing businesses 
simply spend your way out of a reset. All right. Our next question is also related to the recession. Um, well, the best way to prevent a double dip recession is to just leave the recession. Um, I think we can stick to the basic principles of lower taxes, um, less regulations, um, more uh, freedom for the uh, employers. We can prevent we can prevent a double dip recession if we can go on our economy. Okay. Uh, do the Democrats have any questions? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, what we could do is create more of a fair Obviously, no one wants their taxes to be raised, but um, people, people, wealthy people are paying low, low, some of the lowest taxes in recent history, um, but, but tax the rich would put more money for the government. Also, ta tax certain companies that have or are making the ma uh, they're making a killing now, such as oil companies, and they're making the most profits they've ever had, and they're sitting on their hands, not hiring because were made. Why would why would I hire? Give incentives to to hire. They give companies incentives to hire. All right, uh, moving on to the Democrats. Are some companies too big to fail? And if so, what measures ought to be pursued to prevent their failures? All right. Um, what we believe is that no company is too big to fail. However, um, it's, there's, there's industries. Some industries are too big to fail, such as banks, uh, such as the auto industry. Now. Um, Auto industry somehow. Um, so bailing out that industry, it would be a good thing so that people would be able to have jobs. Um, and you know, the, the stimulus package helped out with the bailout. Of To clarify things, we don't necessarily uh, support bailing out every single industry that fails. It, it has to. It's, it's all situational in, the, in this, in, for this uh, question. And we don't, obviously don't support bailing out every single co big company that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say it flat out, and then I'll loop around and explain why no company is too big to fail. Um, our government should not be picking winners and losers in our economy. They shouldn't be spending $500 million on, of taxpayer money on a company that they back, and then two years later it goes bankrupt. And the taxpayers are still one, are my, down $144 billion net to date. Uh, we're not seeing a turn on the, Our government is not in the business of buying and selling companies for a profit. taxpayer a refund, that's absurd. That's going to buy them at a lower cost, let them buy it, let the shareholder hold it, and let them move forward with it. Um, responsible access to credit allowed for small I We're giving money, billions of taxpayer dollars to companies that we or not even ourselves, not even the people that the money's coming from, but those at the top are hand-picking to receive the, these millions of dollars. And it, it's, it's just reckless spending on the government part. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bailouts cost taxpayers $190 billion. Falsely, but um, we were allowing, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were allowing individuals to put welfare down as a source of income, and they were buying houses that they could not afford in the end. What happens is then, 10 years later or so, 2008, the housing market crashes because everyone starts If you own a small business and you make a bad move, you go under and you restructure because you know why? There's somebody else that can come along and do it better than you can. 
and that's what needs to happen at the top too. Just because, it, first off, the GM bailout, they needed a restructuring. allowed them to continue to maintain production the same way, but restructured and less recklessly. And one of the biggest complaints of the GM uh, CEOs and heads at the time of the bank was at like six million, ridiculous prices. It, your company because you can't give them million dollar payouts anymore, that's a problem at the top of the leadership and that's bad for own business and it needs to either be restructured or go under and somebody else will come along and do it better than you did. <laughs> Question goes to the Republicans. How would you address the deficit? Which we've covered a little bit, but just concisely. Okay, um, in my opinion the deficit is the biggest issue facing us today. Um, currently the U.S. takes in about 2.7 trillion spend about 3.8 trillion. Um, that's simply not feasible. Um, a trillion dollar deficit is not is unpatriotic, as Obama put it. Um, John Adams said there are two ways to enslave a nation. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. Um, chances are we're not going to be enslaved by the sword anytime soon, so I guess thanks by the, the Second Amendment. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, a borrow and spend policy will never propel a country out of recession. Um, borrowing and spending that money for the stimulus package did not work in two. When you spend, when you spend um, trillion dollar deficit, it's just you don't have a revenue problem at that point. And um, and all spending needs to be considered when when uh, balancing a budget. Like um, you can't just take from you know you can't just just take from retirement spending or just take from military spending. You have to really take a little bit from everything. Everyone it's going to hurt everyone, but it only hurt a little bit for each person. Uh, Governor, uh, um, well. as we are, but you can't just keep, and I, obviously everyone knows this question just happened this past Friday, you can't, you could, obviously should not keep the spending cuts that are in place, that are currently in place under, that are currently in place. Now, so obviously we have to uh, solve this request here. Um, but we do have revenue problems. Percentage in the middle class, it just, just doesn't make any, any sense. What, what I think we should do is, um, in order for revenue, we need to figure out different ways for us to get revenue to bring in money. Um, so, something that we could do is we could place like a small percentage tax on the uh, on the trading of you know stocks and things like that. It's a very very small percentage because you know, with, with electronic trading and all this stuff, um, you know it, it would it would generate a, a great deal of income that we would be able to use towards bringing down a deficit, I think that's something that we want to do as well. Um, that's, that's the only thing that would really happen. All right. And our last question, we've also touched on a little bit throughout the night. Uh, um, as she said, we pretty much covered this. Uh,